good afternoon everyone thank you all for coming and thank you eric and virat for putting on this great event um uh delighted to be uh moderating this first panel here uh for the alternative data conference my name is tom lehman i'm the development manager for the carnegie Tsinghua center which is a think tank in beijing that focuses on chinese foreign policy i'm also delighted to have these uh these very knowledgeable experts here to join us to talk about things like geopolitics politics the future of uh, the economies right now um we have a lot to talk to talk about and not a lot of time to uh to go through we have only 45 minutes uh so really want to get into it but i want to first start out by uh introducing our, our different speakers uh dr wan Zhe is the chief economist of the china gold corporation and she is also a guest researcher um, at the Chongyang institute uh, of finance at renmin university uh, she focuses and has a number of chief achievements um, dealing with uh, macroeconomic research, financial strategy, um, foreign investment, and uh, market uh, strategy research, among many, many other things. Um, next, uh, we have Mr. Joseph Zhang. Uh, Mr. Joseph Zhang actually just came in on an airplane uh, a couple of hours ago, so we're really glad we were able to make it. Um, Mr. Zhang is uh, the partner and CEO of Greenwood Asset Management in Hong Kong which is actually one of the largest uh, China managers for uh, long and short equities uh, with uh, Chinese equity investments with Chinese companies that are listed in China, in Hong Kong, in the United States as well. Uh, previously, you were at uh, JP Morgan as an investment banker working on uh, M&A and, and IPOs uh, for Chinese banks, insurers, and, uh, and uh, different fund managers as well. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Mr. Peter Reynolds. Um, who is a partner uh, with Oliver Wyman uh, in Hong Kong and co-leads the uh, financial services business in Hong Kong. Has a lot of expertise on financial and risk management, especially with banks and uh, insurers and, and security firms as well. And is doing a lot more on green and sustainable finance at this point too. And finally, uh, Mr. Robert Cope. Um, Rob is the uh, serves as the director and chief economist of the uh, corporate network in Hong Kong for the Economist uh, Group. Uh, he's the author of two books. Uh, one of these is on um, the Silicon Valley model of of, uh, of innovation, uh, of clustered innovation, and the second one is is on the wave of uh, Chinese uh, stock issuances in, in the United States. Um, a frequent speaker on uh, things like geopolitics, China's economy, um, uh, technology and innovation, not just in English, but also in Chinese. So, you know, John, you guys, very good. Hi, can you? Good job. Hi, Sing, hi, Sing. So again, uh, uh, really want to get into this. This is the first panel of the conference, so it's almost like we're painting the scene for the next day and a half. Um, where we'll be talking about the macroeconomic uh, environment, the macro level environment that is uh, influencing how portfolio makers or how portfolio managers are making decisions. Um, so we'll talk about global trends uh, that are acting as either headwinds or tailwinds for global, regional, and um, country level economies. Um, so we'll jump right into it with uh, Dr. Wanja. Dr. Wan, um, over the last year and a half, the headlines have been completely dominated, really, by the U.S.-China trade relationship, by bilateral competition, by economic and technological decoupling, all these different trends. Um, the Trump factor continues to bring a lot of uncertainty to decision making. And just over two months ago, we expected the U.S. and China to come to a deal. Um, that prospect now long, no longer is very clear. Um, beyond that, is, you know, populism continues to be a force that is that is driving a move away from an embrace of global governance um, to one that's more focused on economic nationalism. Um, Boris uh, Boris actually just became the prime minister and will continue to try and push uh, Brexit through. Uh, with these are just a couple things, but in, in your view, what are what are some of the most important and critical geopolitical, economic, and political factors that are pushing global affairs right now? And, and what are some trends that are still beginning to emerge at this point? 
Thank you, Tom, and thank you for all. I'm very glad to be invited to this summit and to this session. Uh, actually, I think this topic is a giant topic. It's very hard to illustrate. But I'd like to say we're talking about actually the topic of the future of the global architecture. Yeah, some people may ask, what is the global architecture? Um, I think it's very hard to uh, define accurately what uh, global architecture is. But never mind, because um, I think even if uh, you don't, you are not sure what exactly global architecture is, but I'm pretty sure that you are pretty sure that um, whatever this global architecture is, is falling apart. Yeah, uh, see what we are talking about today, the wars, the conflicts, like the trade wars, the regional conflicts may happen. Yeah, but I think uh, nowadays, yeah, around the world, we should find some real questions or to say the real problems of all those topics actually. For instance, I think um, about the most popular uh, topic right now, the Signal America trade war right now. I think we, if we see through the mist, um, we'll find some like impossible trinity in it. Yeah, in the request from America to China. Uh, I say the impossible trinity includes three points. Uh, the first is technology upgrading, and the second is the cost advantage, and the third is um, the trade deficit, or to say the trade surplus, uh, based on who to whom. And the logic of it runs like this. If the America, if the United States prevents as it requests, China's technological upgrading progress, then we'll find that um, the Chinese workers will stay at the stage of low skills and low incomes. Then they will have the cost advantage comparing to the American workers in Roosevelt. Then if the United States prevents, uh, as, as it requests, the Chinese workers from competing with American Rust Belt workers, then it would it would be impossible for Chinese to buy more goods, let's say goods, products, uh, services uh, from America. Then the problem of trade deficit cannot be resolved. So we can see conflicts inside conflicts right here. Now we are facing some trade wars, uh, regional conflicts, and nationalisms, uh, or to say the pluralisms. And they all come from the rise of conservatism. And why does the conservatism rise around the world? We say the superficial reason is that the openness, or to say, the inclus inclusiveness, uh, like the globalization, has hurt some countries, as USA claims. But I think the profound reason of the rise of conservatism is that the openness, or to say, the inclusiveness, um, like the globalization, <laughs> has hurt some people in the country. I mean, some certain people in any country. For instance, in American society, uh, for half a century, the top 0.1% bridge had mastered 20% of the wealth of the whole society. And the next 9.9% had mastered about 60% of the wealth. And if your wealth is in the middle level of the whole society wealth system, you want to reach the top 10 level. In 1963, you have to double your wealth six times. And by 2016, this number has become to 25 times. Yes, it is more and more difficult for ordinary people to have this drive back 
to their destiny. And the proportion of middle-aged people in their 30s who have earned more money than their parents um, has, falling, has been falling from about 90% to now about half. So let's say the class, or to say the social mobility is very low and is getting lower. And we, know, we all know a very famous man named Gatsby. Yet it's a character uh, in the novel of the great Gatsby, yeah, written by Fitzgerald. This character in this novel, we can say this, it, it are the models of the class rigidity in America. And in the economic field, we also have this, the great Gatsby curve. It is a chart plotting the positive relationship between inequality and the intergenerational social immobility. It illustrates the connection between the concentration of wealth of one generation and the ability of the next generation to move up the, the economic ladders um, compared to their parents. So let's say, based on this curve, yeah, we can predict that in American society, the persistence of the advantages and disadvantages of income passed from parents to children will rise by about a quarter mm, to the next generation, yeah, as a result of the rise of inequality. As we can see in the last 25 years in, in American society. Yeah, let's say when this social immobility rise, it rises, or to say the class rigidity rises, we can see um, the satisfaction in the whole society for all classes will decline. And the ethnic and class uh, tear uh, I think we are getting worse. We'll be getting worse, I think, yeah. We'll get worse. Um, in the whole society, we'll find that people will accuse each other. The rich will think the poor, you are poor only because you are all lazy. And the poor will think the rich, you are rich only because you are all frauds. Everyone accuses each other and we find that no one can be safe. And everyone has the feeling of anxious and unsafe. So let's say this kind of um, class rigidity will bring about some unsafety or even turmoil. We can see that actually in Brexit, yeah, in Britain, and uh, the yellow vest in France. And also, we can see in the society, um, everyone will call for change. But any substantive change measures will be very difficult to implement. And that can explain why President Trump was elected as the president. Actually, I think when President Obama was elected as the president, President Trump's presidency destiny was coined at the time. Because remember, what was the most popular and inspiring slogans, campaign slogan of Obama's? Yes, we can. And we can do what? We can change. Everyone calls for a change, so they chose Obama. But any substantive change measures would be very hard to implement. So people wanted to choose another more unconventional, fierce someone to be the next president. So it was Trump or someone like him. Yeah, all in all, we can say that uh, the social immobility is the result, actually, of a um, Matthew effect, let's say. Or uh, it's also the result of the monetary policies these years, like 
uh, quantitative easing and helicopter money, something like that. And also, uh, it's the result of the asset bubbles that caused by financialization. Mm, let's return to the topic of what I firstly said, is the future global architecture. Many people say that the global architecture is falling apart because a new Cold War is coming. I totally don't agree with that. Why? Because what is a Cold War actually? We know that Cold War, a so-called Cold War, is this is the Earth, and someone built a war, then force everyone to choose the left way or the right way. But now, what we can see around the world nowadays, in America, they're talking about conservatism, anti-globalization ideas. And in China, you can see capitals happily ever after. And so I think nowadays we must say the left way has nothing right and the right way has nothing left. I think right now the problem is that globalization and financialization, uh, financialization um, have been changing our lives, our world, including our economics, too fast that we are not so prepared to find out the new way out. And whether you like it or not, globalization is a trend. Because even you don't like it, if, even you resent to it, even you resist it, you cannot do it. Why? Because digitalization is coming. And I think digitalization will eventually globalize our us all. Yeah, eventually. So I think right now some governments or politicians, uh, they just don't have the how don't have the idea of how to help us to get the exit of this dilemma. So they move the focus from inside to outside. But I think in short term perspective, this will last for a while. But in long term perspective, it won't last long because people will eventually find out that this kind of wars or conflicts or conservatism, pluralism or nationalism or any whateverism cannot help us, cannot help our world, cannot help our economics. They will only harm us. Yeah. So I think we all need a structural reform. And now we are all buying time for this structural transformation. Yes. Yeah. What can we do to buy the time? I think not to dominate, but to understand yeah, and to listen more. Yeah, that's my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Thank Wadi. You. Um, you brought up a number of really important points, both about the global architecture, social mobility, and the current, you know, the current U.S. trade uh, relationship. Every one of those can probably go into a rabbit hole, uh, you know, the wormhole of more questions. Um, I do want to real quick, I want to move on to uh, uh, Rob um, and ask you kind of about uh, where, where China and China's economy really fits into this picture. Um, so uh, Dr. Wan brought up the kind of the geopolitical context of global affairs right now. Where do you see China's economy at this point? Where do you see it going? Okay, so um, in terms of our house view, and so I'm speaking for the Economist Intelligence Unit, our, our research arm of the Economist uh, group. We are looking at uh, China hitting 5.5% GDP growth out to 2023. Uh, that's a huge drop from where it was, close to 7% for the previous five years. Now, on the face of it, it may sound horrible. Uh, it's obviously a big drop, but this is uh, part of a maturing economy's evolution. So it's actually nothing that we consider that shocking. I think what's uh, unusual, I noticed, I think it seems that a lot of us come from Hong Kong, which is this, uh, apart from headline news, it really always has been traditionally this entry point into China, both for the outside world to look in, China to look out. So 
you don't hear about much of the GDP forecast here as much because it's been so focused on achieving a doubling of GDP growth over, uh, I should say, a doubling of GDP per capita, uh, 2010 to 2020, the anniversary, 100 uh, year anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. We do think that'll be achieved, by the way. So it, it, the official statistics are going to be borne out by uh, the efforts to achieve a growth in the near term. But it's long term where, where stuff gets really interesting in terms of understanding what's going to be happening to the Chinese economy. Now, uh, the trade war, which is the other big topic of discussion, has been having an impact. And it wouldn't have been as bad, that sort of decelerating growth, if the trade war wouldn't be going on. The trade war, uh, as it currently stands just between the US and China, is $360 billion worth of tariff items, right? Uh, 110 out of China, about 250 billion, uh, well, that is, I should say, coming into China. 110, that's what China imposes on US source goods. US is imposing $250 billion on Chinese source goods. And uh, because of uh, the impasse that uh, came about uh, when the deal wasn't made back in May, the tariff rates have gone up. So the pain has become more and more real. We see the decoupling happening. But where the decoupling is really taking place is in goods. And so Wanja there was mentioning uh, this kind of dilemma in terms of solving issues for America if you, if you make, uh, maybe say, labor uncompetitive here in China. It's true that won't accomplish things, but what it will accomplish is this interesting transformation where we're going to see a real decoupling in terms of goods traded, but conversely, we're going to see, I think, a further integration of services. And that was actually something I think was maybe pointed, uh, pointed out in uh, VDAX and with just the preliminary talks before this panel. Um, so China is opening up. And, and the really good news in that regard uh, impacts services and also, of course, particularly financial services. Uh, the Li Keqiang statement at uh, the World Economic Forum in Dalian uh, earlier this month set the stage for that. That had already been in the works since the Guoao Forum. Uh, the previous year where China was announcing this package of uh, financial sector reforms. So we do see, and this is where I think it's very relevant to the people assembled here, an increase in the quality of data, general data, right? So, so the risk-related data quality will be much more increased because Fitch, because Moody's, because S&P. Uh, in deference to my employer, I should point out we are also SMA certified. We do sovereign ratings. We don't do bond ratings, but we do sovereign ratings. And so, uh, we've been operating here a while, uh, but we haven't had the problem that previous raiders had where if you, for example, were looking at a state-owned enterprise that had to be given sovereign, right, ratings. You, you, it was really interesting to science here that Chinese uh, analysts talk about this, like they, they list out all these problems and then say, but we're giving it triple A, right, because we have to. Uh, so that's all changing, and that is profound, right? So tough news, yes, the U.S. and China do seem to be decoupling. That's our house view. That's my personal view. That's really happening. The, the, trades in, the trade in goods is really suffering right now. And it's wearing down on the Chinese economy, to your original question there, Tom. But it's getting interesting because of services. And it's also getting interesting because of the sorts of things it's making happen in the Chinese economy. So our biggest risk assessment overall, and this is consistent with a lot of other observers, is in leverage and particularly property, right? So China has an enormous amount of debt to GDP leverage. Uh, a lot of uh, people from inside China you know, will point out, well, look at the US, look at Japan, they're even higher. That's true. But they're at a much further stage of economic evolution compared to China. And that's why it's problematic here. Um, so rather than get into what that really means, let me point out where it's interesting, again, for asset managers and people who are looking at things like ratings and trying to get really good data on this stuff, junk bonds. A really good article, I'll just point out, uh, in deference to another financial media company, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal just had, I thought, a very good uh, exploration of how the, uh, I used to be working with Michael Milken, so he'd kill me if I was saying this, but junk bonds, right, high yield debt. That's become a, a huge, a booming industry right now, uh, increasing more than 13-fold uh, since less than 10 years ago. So out of nowhere, you've got now junk bonds, particularly in the property sector, 
So Kaisa and e takers, 11 percent, four years. I think it's 300 million. Uh, Kaisa, of course, defaulted on its offshore U.S. dollar bonds just about four years ago, but it is back in the market. And these are being, I understand, in, in this, uh, I've heard it from other sources too, but the Wall Street Journal article illustrates how you have a lot of very well established fund managers willing to take on this sort of debt. And by the way, I'm not making a knock against Kaisa. I'm just saying this is a, a wild and woolly territory. And it, it brings up all sorts of interesting questions about how you should be actually looking at that debt. Now that, that sort of issuance is way beyond investment grade, but you have very serious takers. And it's not just Kaisa, it's all, in fact, I think it was Tahoe Group issued a new uh, high yield bond is issuance uh, just this month as well. So uh, these are uh, shorter term durations, but they're, they're world beating uh, levels of uh, the coupon. So it's like uh, in the teens. The average is 8% for China. Uh, that's compared to 3% for European uh, high yield. Uh, the US average is 6%. So it, it already shows how China's adjusting to this pricing. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, no less an authority than Wilbur Ross, the current Commerce Secretary of the United States, would actually brag about a China premium. You'd pay more uh, for China on the um, straightforward equity side. But now it's gone into this new interesting area of, uh, for example, air, sectors like high yield debt. Again, coming out of nowhere. And, and again, also a reflection of what's been happening in this change in US-China trade relations. Just make a final point here, and that is, so within all that kind of mixed news, the good and the bad of the trade war, good and the bad of property and, and leverage in the Chinese economy, I'd say the really interesting sector to look at and also a symbol of what is changing in China is consumer. So I think most, uh, even foreigners, uh, have heard of Singles Day, this, this big uh, cel uh, shopping celebration pioneered really by Alibaba. I don't know uh, how many, I mean, obviously those of you in China were following this, but outside of China you followed uh, JD.com celebration, which uh, took place for the first half of June this year. Uh, that had a 26% uh, increase. Uh, that was to the tune of, I want to make sure I got my figures here correct. Um, yeah, that was 30 billion. They raised close to 30 billion dollars in sales in just over about two weeks. Okay. Uh, so the retail sector, we, we see that uh, achieving about six trillion dollars this year. Oh no, I'm sorry, I, actually to be more accurate, it's gonna be even higher this year. That's 2018 data, six trillion dollars. Japan's GDP, the entire GDP of Japan is 5.1 trillion, uh, our estimate for this year. So China's retail sector is a country in itself, and that's growing, that's growing in lots of interesting ways. I mentioned the JD.com uh, uh, sales push. I expect there'll be another big uh, boom uh, for Singles Day and Alibaba and associated suppliers. So as China is facing the headwinds of the trade war, it is able to turn to a big source, not just the fiscal stimulus and, and monetary levers that it has significantly here domestically, while those represent issues uh, for leveraging in the economy, the consumer sector is a great fallback, and it's already going uh, forward in lots of ways, particularly technology related. My final point on this, because I think it, it immediately impacts those of you interested in alternative data, and that is China is probably going to be the world's best source for alternative data going forward. I'm not just saying that because I'm at this conference. I truly believe it. It could be curtailed if China starts to adopt regulatory policies in line with the rest of the world. Currently, China has nothing along the lines of GDPR or data privacy as we know in the United States. Uh, I was actually at a well-known, uh, several Chinese brands demonstration. I won't say who they were. This was just uh, recently. And they were showing me what the possibilities for 5G are. And, and the amount of data they could, they could illustrate that can be collected by a single person, uh, basically just in a park at, at, a, at a single position because of this pervasive surveillance as uh, we would cringe in the West, but in China is quite accepted. And, and it's just part of everything, not only from your daily activities and the social credit score and those things, but the way you are in transacting with FinTech. The amount of big data that can be found here, the way you can map that, I, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. So we'll see if that changes, but that is one of the other saving graces for China. This is also a country, just to move it back in a final point, where, where you have this unevenness in, in ratings quality, the big data gives you another kind of uh, eloquent way, uh, very sophisticated way to understand 
uh, patterns that we can't get in other markets. So there's good and bad of that. I'm not making a, a judgment in terms of um, you know the, the uh, righteousness of, of being able to access that data, but for investors and, and companies wanting to take advantage of what that offers, the opportunities I think are tremendous, and that's going to be the big bright spot of the Chinese economy going forward. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, thank you for painting a picture of China, China's economy, and the strengths and the weaknesses at this point. Um, Peter, if we could with you, would you help us answer this question of, of the the West uh, full market? I mean. Um, there, there seem to be a number of areas where, at, at this point, the, you know, the, uh, the, the Trump's taxes have, have kind of stopped in terms of their fuel for the uh, Western market. What, what is pushing it forward, and, and what, should there, what risks should we be looking at in terms of what might turn it into a bear market or, or bear territory? That's a very big question. Um, so. In terms of what's pushing it forward, I mean, I think we've all talked about various different stimulus that's coming through from a political perspective. Um, you see the recent tweets and the uh, now consensus view, I think, that the Fed's uh, likely to cut rates uh, this week. Um, and that's a big turnaround, obviously, from where it was before. Um, so I think quite surprising level of continued stimulus into the economy in the US, but also here in China, and, and then continued in Europe a little bit as well. Um, so, I guess from, from our perspective, you know, kind of that's continuing to inflate um, potentially a little, um, and it remains a, a very, very long bull market that we've been through. Um, so, uh, when that's going to end, this is clearly the, the, the trillion dollar question. Um, from my own personal perspective, I, I think it's, it's sort of surprising to me that there's been a significant decoupling of what you might think of the economic indicators and the political situation on the ground. Um, I, I'm British, so the Brexit story is obviously there, but you know the, the pound dollar has gone to 121 today. Um, but that's now five, six days since Boris Johnson came in, and three days since, or two, three, four days since there was a real listen to government is now expecting a no-deal Brexit to be going forwards. It amazes me that there's a four day window there with our supposedly efficient market and, and only now does the market start to react. And I think it indicates a little bit some of the sort of challenges that we've seen on the political side, which is I think that we all live in a bubble as well. So the information that we're getting and the type of data that we're, we're processing, you know, I don't think we think we, we don't, we don't see the reality quite as much, I think, as, as, as potentially is, is really there, partly because we're all also captured by the sort of technological trend of hearing in the echo chamber of various different social networks what we want to hear rather than what's actually happening. Uh, so I think as we think about the risks, they're, I think, full circle back to that sort of link between the, the political and economic uh, pieces together. And honestly, here within, within the Chinese context, it feels like the, 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 the state has understood the power of that technology to really influence what's happening and has control over that in a, in a way that is obviously more significant than it is in other markets as well. So. Um, that doesn't really answer your question as to when, um, but I think it's probably um, you know, kind of, uh, a relatively significant event. And, and then we've, we've seen sort of crises previously been really driven by economics, almost outside of the political space. And, you know, if we go back in history, a lot of economic crises were actually you know, driven by the political sphere. So I think potentially we're underestimating the, the, the risk factor associated with politics associated on that. Absolutely, the, uh, the one is, is definitely probably the most difficult, I mean, it's a hundred billion dollar question. Um, uh, Joseph, uh, given the geopolitical context, the economic context, and, and especially kind of looking at China right now, um, in, in terms of application uh, and, and thinking of investment, and especially the, the people who are, who are here, um, uh, Ron started talking about it, kind of these areas of, of of strength in the Chinese economy, but what, what do you see as, as investment areas that, that are hold opportunities, and, and then what are areas that, that hold, potentially hold risks? And then what do you think are, are, are again, emerging kind of trends for, for, for future investment opportunities in China? 
I learn a lot from the other speakers. Um, I think they deliver very important messages. But we're not a macro manager. We have been a model not manager since the inception of 2004. So I will share with some insights about our bottom up ideas in both the opportunities as well as the risk front. Um, everything I'm speaking today are my personal opinions. They're not necessarily the, the views of my, my partner. Um, in terms of risk, we are cautious, cautiously optimistic because as, as the other speakers spoke about it, we think the slowdown of Chinese economy is very visible. And also, the trade war still has an impact on, and for the short term, there is still impact on sentiment from manufacturers to consumers, no doubt about that. But in the long term, the trade war may bring opportunities to Chinese people, as uh, Dr. Wang uh, talked about it. But for the short term, we do see a um, challenge to Chinese consumers, as well as Chinese corporates. Um, we have also seen the risk with the leverage. You have seen the recent events with Chinese banks, um, from Baoshan to recently certain other city commercial banks. We're not seeing a systematic risk, but we have, we're watching to see whether this will make the funding cost in China to spike up. It's, it doesn't have to happen because the government and the central bank, they have a lot of weapons in their arsenal. For example, the interest rate in China is still relatively high. As we know, a lot of the interest rates in most other developed countries are in the negative area. And if the U.S. cut the interest rate, it could happen tomorrow or you know, who knows. But if the U.S. cut the interest rate, we do see a strong motivation for China to follow suit. Particularly if there is a um, uh, pressure due to the recent uh, uh, pressure on the uh, with the uh, city commercial banks. So if that's the case, the money supply could be a driver of the equity market. So that's why we believe it's very difficult to be a macro manager. We admire our peers who are playing macro strategy. For us we always have a higher conviction from a bottom-up perspective. Opportunity-wise, uh, we do see opportunities in, for example, consumption. As um, my fellow speakers pointed out, China's consumption is very strong, as Bob talked about it. Um, recently, the consumption in China slowed down. We have seen that decline from double-digit growth to single digits. But it doesn't stop. High quality Chinese consumer companies who deliver double digit returns, I mean double digit growth, earning growth. We are talking about food and beverage companies, liquor companies, and for example, we're in a restaurant business listed in Hong Kong. It's, I believe, the largest chain restaurant business in China. It's listed in Hong Kong. We have seen, as you know, last year, the trade war, the leverage, make Chinese economy quite nasty last year. But the business of these restaurant operator still was up 50, 60 percent last year. So we can see alpha players in a slowdown environment, they can still deliver very strong earning growth. We have seen similar phenomenon happening in e-commerce, in TNT. For example, um, Bob also talk about e-commerce, and we are in a few other e-commerce players. We have seen they also deliver double-digit earning growth, top-line growth, GMV growth across the, their business lines. So from a top-down perspective, we think the, um, the challenges are still there. But from bottom-up perspective, in consumption, in e-commerce, and healthcare, yeah, we are also a big investor in healthcare. We even have a healthcare fund because we have seen a lot of challenges with Chinese uh, people and Chinese uh, population can be transformed into opportunities, into investment opportunities. For example, the pollution. We all know China's air quality is in a lower quality than a lot of the other countries, but 
the water pollution in China is actually very alarming also. But how can we benefit from this? We should consider investing into innovative drug companies, treating or curing cancers because of this, you know, for example, the environment as well as the aging effects. Because Chinese people, Chinese population, including ourselves, we're aging. By year 2020, we believe Chinese people over 65 years old would account for more than 20% of Chinese population. And it's, it's getting worse. So if China follow what happened in Japan 20 or 30 years ago, who are going to benefit from this? We believe healthcare service providers are going to one of them. Drug companies are going to benefit from that, right? So that's why we have been trying to transform China's challenges into investment opportunities, trying to benefit from that. There are also other areas, such as uh, services. For example, property management. We have also decent investments in property management. For real estate business, there are both long and short opportunities. But for property managers, I think a lot of people in this room, you tend to agree, even a lot of the properties, they're have taken, even they are vacant, you still have to pay the management fee. And the property management companies, if they are affiliated to their developer parents, they can easily get a new business from their parents through the new property sales every year. We're not saying this is a risk-free area. We actually have a fair trade in property management business. We long some sure the other. But we do see huge opportunities with Chinese services. The other areas include life insurance, you know. For the time's sake, I want to stop here. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, if you'd like to <clears throat> briefly go on what you said they did, because I think the, there's, a, there's a risk that we sort of treat China as one amorphous blob uh, in a lot of what we're discussing here. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research recently at the province, the sub-province level, to really understand um, what's you know, precisely the economic situation looks like in that particular area, what the implication is on the retail, uh, retail sector, what the implication is on the real estate side of things, and then also looking at consumer leverage, uh, because while I completely agree with Robert's point around the consumer power here, there's also quite a significant bell-shaped curve if you actually look at the consumer leverage. So we always talk about averages, but the one thing we found out from the financial crisis is that averages only tell you know, a small part of the story. And if you look at the consumer leverage by province or sub-province, you see very, very different averages, but also very different distributions. And so a significant portion of some of those consumers who are sitting in a point where they're really only financing their leverage with further debt. Um, and so continuing to pay that off in a spiraling way. So I think it, it goes to sort of the point with this conference, which is really, there's a bunch of extra data and information that we really need to understand this at a micro level, and I completely agree with your bottom-up micro perspective rather than the top-down. So we have about uh, two minutes left, actually, um, and uh, happy to open it up to any questions from the audience. Um, we've had uh, you know, really excellent uh, uh, contributions from all four of our, our speakers here, um, and if there are any questions, happy to open Not everyone's speechless. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, thank you all again uh, for uh, joining us in this panel, and I really hope that uh, this panel was able to kind of present a, broad, a broader context of what the rest of the conference is going to be trying to achieve and in, in figuring out and, and explaining how to better use and, um, alternative data and, and alternative data tools. Um, recognizing that all of this is happening within these global affairs, recognizing that all of this is happening within uh, this larger context. Um, so thank you again, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the uh, conference, the rest of the two and a half, uh, day and a half. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>